today, we're going to be talking about strategic currency positioning and enhancing your international investment strategy. This is a presentation that we uh, are quite excited about at WHVP. Putting it together was quite interesting. I mean, we're involved in investing uh, outside of the US markets, um, but we think it's an interesting position, also uh, challenging uh, in some context to understand what is happening. So I'm gonna try to keep it um, uh, pretty understandable. If you don't understand anything, that's fine. We're not gonna go into two depths because we didn't want a three hour presentation, but to give a basic understanding and overview. So before we jump in, I wanna show you this uh, chart here. This is from the, the Fed or Fred uh, website, looking at the, the consumer price index um, for the purchasing power of the US dollar. Um, we're looking at it from essentially 2000 until today. As you can see, there's been a serious reduction in its purchasing power in the US. Again, this is average cities that can you know, fluctuate depending on where you live in the US, but in general, you see the purchasing power falling of the US dollar uh, with slight upticks, of course, but the trend is continually down constantly. So that's kind of the picture that, okay, so why does this matter? Is there anything that I can do to uh, combat this? So what we're gonna talk today about is hedging versus positioning. What that difference is, it's gonna be just real brief trying to give you an understanding of what hedging is versus what positioning is. Then we're gonna do a case study of the Swiss franc to the US dollar. I'll get into why we're gonna talk about the Swiss franc specifically. Uh, and then we'll talk about Switzerland as a financial jurisdiction, how they're set up, what their economy makeup is, how their government kind of runs the, the finance and how the, their central bank runs their interest rate levels and price stability and what their focus is. And then we'll talk about obviously working with WHVP and investing offshore, what that looks like. So a little bit about myself, so you can get to know me a bit better. My name is Jess Roberson. I am a part of the investment team here at WHVP, as well as aiding in investment research. I do client onboarding. So if you, if a client comes to us and wants to open a bank account, I'm the one that usually leads them through that. I have my own clients as well, so I manage that and I help our marketing efforts as well in terms of strategy and implementation. In my free time, if I'm not with my wife in the Swiss mountains, many of you might be able to hear my, my accent is very American. I am American, but I'm married a, a Swiss, a beautiful Swiss lady that I met. And uh, so I spend a lot of time with her. When I'm not doing that, I'm playing with the Swiss rugby team in my free time. Um, it's fun to compete at an international level as well as pushing myself in the workplace. I studied uh, finance. I minored uh, with international business. I, my mother tongue is English. Uh, I speak German, the high German, as well as the Swiss German dialect. Thanks to my wife. She taught me that, so I, I do appreciate that. So enough about me. Let's move on, hedging and positioning. So straightforward definition of hedging is to pre protect oneself financially. This is usually to bias or sell a commodity's future to protect against a loss uh, in price fluctuation. So this can be done on a commodity itself. It can be done on stock positions um, where you essentially want to buy a position that will move in the opposite direction of the position that you've taken. This is more of an instrument that you buy when it comes to investing to challenge or to really reduce losses should they occur. Um, positioning, on the other hand, is arranging your investments and it comes to investing in a way where you see a trend and you want to position uh, with that trend or against that trend. So that's kind of just the basic versus when you hear hedging, we hedge against this. It's usually an action where you're buying a, a hedged position. Positioning is saying, hey, we see these things that are for the long run going to be against this trend or with this trend. And so I want to buy investments that are positioned in that way for the long-term outcome. So that's kind of essentially the positioning versus hedging. Often hedging gets thrown around when it comes to investing offshore. That can be the case sometimes. In our case, it's more about positioning. So I wanna show you the US dollar index. This kind of, this index essentially shows the power of the US dollar against a basket of other currencies. There's six currencies that uh, the US dollar index goes against. You have the Euro with nearly a 60% weight. So this 
graph or the strength or the US dollar index will move strongly based on the euro um, and its exchange rate between the US dollar and the euro. The next position that you have is the Japanese yen. Then you have the Canadian dollar, you have the great British pound uh, that have similar weighting. And then you have the Swedish krona. And then finally you have the Swiss franc. What's interesting to note is the Swiss franc has the least weight position in this whole index. So that price shift doesn't move this as much. If there's a price shift between the Swiss franc uh, in terms of its uh, spot price, where you can exchange or its exchange rate has less of an effect on this, almost the smallest. What's interesting about that is the history of the Swiss franc. And that's why as investors, we want to look at, okay, what is happening in the world? Where are the currencies? Where are the economies? And where are the winners? So that's what we're going to kind of look at and try to look at. That's why in our case studies, we're going to be looking at the Swiss franc. If we had to look, if we did little case studies on all of the, the various currencies, which we can do, this would be a three hour presentation. Um, so we're just going to pick the Swiss franc for now. We are biased to the Swiss franc. We're based in Switzerland. Um, when it comes to investing, which we'll get to later, uh, we're, we're strongly uh, in favor of the Swiss franc. We just want to get the overall position of what it looks like of a currency versus the US dollar and how you kind of measure it. How we're going to be doing this, we're going to look at a four year perspective, 14 year perspective, and 30 year perspective. We did this really to just kind of, I guess, not take times that were necessarily bad, but kind of good and look at, okay, what was that being the starting point? What was the fluctuation throughout time? Because we can't use the data of our, um, our investments because they're individual mandates where we tailor make portfolios. We're just going to take the, the a benchmark in the U S and a benchmark in Switzerland, which is the S and P 500 for the U S for Switzerland. It's the Swiss market index. And we're just going to look at their performance over these time periods. We're going to look at the inflation environment in the U S and the appreciation of the Swiss franc against the U S dollar and kind of just take a tact, you know, look at basic overview of what, what that kind of comes out to. So on the four year, uh, in the, fir uh, in the four year outlook, uh, you have the U S experiencing 23% inflation. So a lot of inflation in, in four years, obviously the U S coming out of a very high inflationary environment, you know, 23% since 2019 is massive. Um, the S and P in that time, uh, returned about 54%. So that's up. Up and down, that's just kind of its total cumulative from where we started in, in, in 2019 um, of September to where we are today. Well, uh, about a week ago when I put this together. Um, and so what you have to do there to get the real return is minus the inflation. So you have 54% up, but you have a 31% return in actual purchasing power because you have to reduce the inflation. Uh, the worst year there being 19% down. So if you lost, uh, uh, I guess your if you allowed emotions to creep in and you exit the market, you know there could have been some some serious challenges and not allowing uh, that to recover. So in the U.S., uh, when we looked at the Swiss franc, the Swiss franc increased by 14.8% um, since September 2019 against the U.S. dollar. Uh, the SM, SMI return, the Swiss market index, was 34%. There, you add. The appreciation of the Swiss franc against the U.S. dollar, especially when you're a U.S. investor investing in a different currency, you have to take that that appreciation or depreciation and include it into the return, leaving at 48 percent. So a little bit less than 54 percent. But if you were to say, OK, I want to close the account, pull it all back into U.S. dollars, then you're a 25 percent return. So, OK, the inflation hits in when I pull it back into the U.S. into my purchasing power to use. And there you're a little bit less 31%, but you can see that there is a power to the appreciation of the currency against your reference currency as an American being the U S dollar. So let's look at the 10 year. What, what kind of changed here? We see, uh, the, the inflationary environment environment for 14 years since 2010 is 44%. So. In that four years, in the last case study, you had 23%. So then if you extend that 10%, you had another 21% inflation, roughly 2% annually of inflation that you have to account for each year. So not a huge jump, not a crazy uh, big jump, 
but still 20% inflation eating at your purchasing power. The S&P uh, returned great, 229%. The worst year was still 2022, so you had a lot of good times. I mean, in the U.S. stock market from 2010 uh, to 2020, markets were amazing. I mean, you uh, there were some there were some challenges obviously at the beginning, but it was kind of just turnover after turnover, really great markets. You know, we don't come against the U.S. market at all. Uh, we just think there should be diversification in your overall portfolio structure. So real return after minus that out, 184%. Um, great returns. No one's going to shake their head at that. I certainly wouldn't. You look at the Swiss franc, didn't appreciate by so much more, maybe 3% more during that time. There's actually some relative strength in the U.S. dollar, kind of some volatility, which we'll show in a graph later. Um, but again, still appreciated more than in the four year. Uh, the return was 91%, so not a 229. Total return, if you add that appreciation, is 208% or 108%, excuse me. So a good, a good return, not 184%. Um, but when you, if you were to take it out now, you know, 64% return, okay, it's not as good over a 14 year period as 184%. Clearly that's the case. However, if you leave it in and let it go, and that's what we're going to see in the next one, there's going to be significant increases and you're not in a high inflationary uh, period. I mean, you look at the at Switzerland, when you look at their inflation numbers, They've been within inflation except for the high inflationary period of 2021 and 2022. They never went above 3.5%, but that was their high inflationary period. Before that, going back almost 20 years, they exceeded their targets one or two times, maybe. Otherwise, they've always been very low inflation, if not slight deflation, meaning the currency holds strong. So case study three, a 30-year perspective. Here you see the inflation really take up 112% inflation in the US. That's just an unbelievable number to, to, to try to fathom that you've lost 100% or 100% of inflation has taken place since 1994. Great returns as well, 455%. So you beat inflation, uh, but minus that 334%. Again, no one's going to shake their head at every 10 years, you know, uh, essentially 100%. Uh, plus, but then we look at the Swiss franc appreciated 36% against the US dollar. The SMI returned 360 or 76%, add that up to 412. So then you beat you beat the the US real inflation by holding it in Swiss franc over time. Now, if you say, okay, I close it done 300 percent still not gonna shake my head at that. That's great returns. And you've reduced some of the volatility of the US dollar purchasing power over time. You've had solid returns. And that's where we move into looking at okay, where has the US, where, like, here's the picture exactly of what we we're talking about of the Swiss franc versus the US dollar over time. Now, this is from 1970 to 2024. Uh, it says that the US dollar is now trading at uh, uh, 0.85. It's actually around 0.84. It's actually lowered, lowered a little bit. But you see in those three case studies that there is this period between 2010 and 2020 where there's kind of just a stagnation in upper or in uh, devaluation. But then we see that trend starting to go down again. And I mean, if you go back to the 70s, you're not talking about 34% appreciation against the US dollar. You're talking about 500% appreciation against the US dollar. So there's this long-term trend, and especially when you talk about the government debt levels. In 2000, the, the US government, well, really 2000, between 2002 and 2004, the US government started really increasing their debt levels. They had been increasing before, but really blew up. Um, so there you have this this start to see this weakening against the Swiss franc in the early 2000s as the U.S. debt goes up. And actually during that time period, the Swiss population was concerned with overspending or the government creating too much debt. So they put in a debt break, which limits the, the federal government from spending or creating more debt to a certain percentage points against gross domestic product. So Switzerland said, hey, at 43%, the government can't have more debt than 43% of our gross domestic product or how much our economy is, is producing. And so that really made them allocate. And there you see, again, this falling 
this this fiscal responsibility taking place in the Swiss in Switzerland and fiscal irresponsibility taking place in the US and you see that start to trend down again where the US dollar had kind of started to pick a bit of momentum up in the late 90s um, but then it started to lose it again because their spending got out of control and Switzerland got their spending in control. So why positioning matters for you as a US investor looking outside to go global with a portion of your portfolio. So these two graphs show really interesting pictures. These graphs are actually from a study, a, uh, a case study that Vanguard did um, saying, okay, what's the benefits to volatility, meaning the price shifts up and down, the highs and lows, where is the benefit? And what we say is the benefit is creating a portfolio that's not volatile, that has sustainable growth, that's not giving these huge ups and downs and ups and downs, but stable growth, stable movement. And it shows that if you invest between 25 to 30% of your investable wealth outside of the US stocks and bonds, you reduce your volatility effectively. Uh, if, you, if you do too much, it's not as effective anymore. If you do too little, it's not as effective. There's that right, that sweet spot, as you can see in both these graphs of the 10 year and the overall, you can see that there's that sweet spot between 25 and 30%. And that really shows, okay, there is some stability that is brought about when you invest outside of the US dollar into stocks, bonds, denominated and other currencies. And that's where our job comes in is finding those winners, not just, you know, in everything, because not every currency moves like the Swiss franc, not every currency moves um, in the same way, there are different economic environments, there are different economies, there are different governments, there are different central banks managing them. So that's where an outside investor comes in and looks for those that are going to help you in your position. So what are the factors that are depreciating the US dollar? You have monetary policy. This is the government debt levels, which we're going to get into just a little bit later that affect that, how they're spending, what their debt levels are. You have economic growth in the US. They target 2% inflation because they want their economic growth to grow and grow. In Switzerland, they say inflation uh, can be anywhere between zero and 2%. We're gonna be okay with that. Um, that's they, they give themselves a range, which is kind of there. The US is, tries to aggressively grow for a large economy and they need inflation to grow. Then you have rising prices and inflation. So that obviously depreciates the dollar. If you have prices rising, you can get less with your money that's causing inflation. Currency demand right now, the US dollar is the world reserve currency. There's some countries trying to challenge it. I don't think it'll lose its current or its reserve status uh, immediately, um, but there's certainly challenges. And as that becomes, US dollar slowly becomes less of a, a, a important or desired currency, uh, there's gonna be some, some price or some purchasing power price uh, challenges that come that could depreciate the US dollar and then export prices. Here it's interesting because the US dollar doesn't really has, have super high incentive. The US government doesn't have high incentive to have the US dollar too strong because that means other countries won't wanna buy products from the US. And so there has to be kind of this currency aware, uh, uh, the U.S. has to be aware of how strong its currency is um, in relation to its global trade partners. It's also part of why the U.S. has a lot of debt in Europe. They don't want the euro to become uh, too weak or too expensive because they want a, a more return on the debt that they've lended out. Getting it in euros translated to U.S. dollar, they get more in that translation. So these are some of the factors that are kind of affecting it. I want to bring up the U.S. debt to GDP. I mean, we see, as I mentioned, starting in the 2000s, this real rise um, in debt and really spiking during the hard economic times in 2008, spiking and continually up. What's interesting to see is this tick in 2020 where you see it go up and then it starts to come down. Why is that? Well, the reason that is, is the only way to really get rid of government debt is you either stop spending and reduce your debt by paying it off, usually means higher taxes because that's how you're going to pay it off or inflation outpaces your interest rate. So the U S had incredibly high uh, inflation and that's a way that you can bring that government debt to GDP down because you're paying, you can pay off more because the, it, the inflation is so high and the interest rate is lower. So that's why we see that tick up. 
There's no plan, if you look at the Federal uh, Budgeting Office of the U.S., there's no plan to decrease the debt in the U.S. They're going to keep spending. Um, the projections are, are, are absolutely astronomical. I would encourage you to go look at the, the White House uh, budget, uh, budgetary office and, and look at their projections. It, it is certainly shocking. So, okay, so Switzerland, what, where is Switzerland at? You know, I kind of mentioned their debt break, but this is what it looks like. This is Switzerland's debt to GDP. So if we go back to the US debt to GDP, they're up at around 120% of debt to their gross domestic product or what the economy produces. Switzerland is right at around 20-ish percent when it comes to their central government's debt, which is such a small number. Now, if you add their total debt to GDP, they're at about 42%. So a little bit higher than this, but we see this graph coming down. Why is that? If you look early 2000s, that's when the debt, you see that spike up. And that's when the Swiss population came together and said, hey, we don't like this increasing amount of debt. We want a debt break. The population voted on it. It was accepted. They passed it. And then you see this efficient spending and government debt reducing because it has to stick to a certain limit. So this is you know, a movement from the population of Switzerland that put government spending in control and make sure that they allocate it properly. The reason this matters on a, on a, a country's currency is that there's a certain percentage of debt that you can have as a country before it starts weighing on your economy. And that's right at around 72 to 75 percent. When you go above that, you actually start dragging the economy to a certain extent. And Switzerland said, hey, we as a population will only be comfortable with 42, 43, 44 percent and no more. It can't be moved. It's it's it was a voted referendum. Um, it's not like the debt ceiling where Congress can just say, OK, we approve more spending. Let's tick it up. That doesn't happen in Switzerland. And this also allows for the stable nature of the Swiss franc to take place. So there's going to be less inflation. Uh, there's going to be less uh, of that debt pulling on the economy and, and affecting the currency as a part of it. So why Switzerland in general? Why is it interesting? I mean, first is the history behind Switzerland. Uh, their private banking dates back to the 15th century when they were taking care of the aristocrats' wealth ar around Europe, especially with a lot of transitory and the, the, the different uh, families owning parts of Europe or controlling parts of Europe. Switzerland was a place where private banking started to thrive so that they could manage that. Um, they've been militarily internationally recognized. They themselves have been neutral since 1815. Uh, so they don't get involved. This keeps them out of a lot of conflicts. It keeps the nation quite peaceful in terms of uh, not having to worry about any existential threat or getting involved where they're sending money abroad. Uh, they have an exceptional uh, education system with some of the highest universities um, around Europe, even in the world, based in Switzerland. Uh, it produces incredible amount of professionalism, integrity, and uh, they have a culture of privacy. Now, this culture of privacy dates back to the 15th century, but it actually sits into their constitution uh, that their citizens have the right to privacy. And that is also further seen for people who say, I want to use the, the Swiss uh, uh, financial center. I want to use their jurisdiction for my wealth to, to manage my wealth that they have a banking privacy law that we're uh, any financial um, service provider can't share your information with any third party. Now, you are obligated to report uh, to your tax authorities, but other than that, no one knows uh, anything about you. Your data can't be leaked, and that is punishable by the strict laws and federal regulations that not only ensure that the, the financial providers or, or service providers are following uh, solid practices, but also if their information is leaked, it costs them potential prison time and serious fines. The other side of it is Switzerland has 240 banks that operate in Switzerland, in private banks. What's interesting here is the US banking market is massive. There's huge banks, massive amount of banks in the US. But if you go bank to per population, Switzerland actually has more banks. There's a high level of competitiveness. Um, Switzerland manages 25% of cross-border wealth, so there's about $10 trillion um, in cross-border wealth, meaning it's managed. The, the owner is not in the country where it's managed. Switzerland manages 25% of that, roughly $2.5 trillion being managed in Switzerland uh, through that cross-border wealth. So it makes that the laws Switzerland has in place really are there to protect 
not just its citizens, but those people who are using uh, its financial jurisdiction. So uh, one of the questions in the Q&A uh, bar was, uh, what is Switzerland's inflation? Right now, it's uh, at 1.1%. Uh, when they had high inflation uh, during the inflationary period where everyone was experiencing 9 10% inflation, Switzerland maxed out at 3.5%, so one-third, essentially, of all the other jurisdictions. And part of that is, as I mentioned earlier, Switzerland's national bank, the, the Swiss national bank, has a range of inflation and it's zero to two percent and their only their only mandate as a central bank is price stability they don't have to worry about inflate or unemployment they only have to worry about the swiss franc's price stability the swiss franc is wanted by many people i mean we saw that in the last slide where 2.5 trillion dollars are being managed in switzerland a lot of that being held in swiss franc um, so there's a lot of demand for the swiss franc especially for the size of the country and so there you have to really be watching price stability that the Swiss franc doesn't immediately jump too strong and then, you know, things die off a little bit and then it gets weak. They don't want that volatility. So they really look to make sure that there's that stability in the currency. And that's what you've seen. Now we've seen it on the side, especially against the US dollar, of strengthening constantly throughout history against the US dollar. Um, with short upticks, of course, there is volatility and price change, but the price stability in Switzerland is very interesting in, in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, they have a, they, they're a really wealthy nation and they have high reserves as a government and that low debt that we were talking about. Actually, if you go back, um, if you look at the past, I think it's, gosh, 12, 15 years um, or no, 25 years, excuse me. They've only not been a surplus government, I think, five years out of the past 25 years, maybe five or six years, um, potentially. And so you see this, you see this incredible ability to manage the country on a government standpoint in terms of economy, of not overspending, being fiscally responsible uh, as a government, that when the when there are emergencies and things, there are uh, stimulus packages that need to put be put out. They have reserves to do it, and they don't have to increase their debt. A perfect example is the COVID pandemic response when Switzerland is actually um, only increased their national debt by one percent. Everything else they paid for with their reserves. I mean, this is an incredible move when you saw other countries jumping debt levels like crazy. I mean, we saw that in the US, it, it just skyrocketed uh, with all of these stimulus packages and Switzerland didn't have that. So I want to talk now about, okay, what's the setup? If, if you say, okay, I'm interested in investing or setting up a bank account in Switzerland and having it managed from Switzerland to get this diversification into my portfolio, um, how does that work? So you or the client are obviously the pinnacle of the situation. Excuse me. The pinnacle of the relationship. We as the asset manager only work with the limited power of attorney with you, and we have contractual agreements with the custodian bank. But you are the direct owner of the bank account in Switzerland, or your trust, or your LLC, or your IRA, or your offshore trust, or your offshore LLC. That is the direct owner. We don't own it. We don't pull funds. It's your account. We only manage with a limited power of attorney to build the portfolio and that's it. Meaning if we, if anything were ever to happen to us, your assets are safe at the bank. We select banks very carefully to ensure that they are one, well capitalized, that they don't take risks, that they are entrepreneurial minded, usually family owned private banks here in Switzerland and Liechtenstein. If you have questions about that, we can obviously talk about it later, but I don't want to get caught up too much on that. I want to talk about kind of the benefits of that offshore bank account. We've already kind of talked about the currency, but I want to talk about a little bit more. And that's first, you get an independent partner. Often, if you go uh, to a, a bank itself uh, and you let them manage it and under a discretionary mandate, um, there's conflict of interest in what they book. Banks often put out products themselves that they can book into your portfolio. That, that can create a conflict of interest. We don't have that because we don't have products. Uh, we really get to make the best decision for you and your financial situation and your portfolio. You have access to uh, the owners in the company, which allows us to have some pretty good leverage at the banks we work with. 
if our owners go, they're going to be talking to upper management. They're not with the bank. They're not going to be talking to middle management. Problems are going to be able to solve. It creates a lot of, of leverage uh, on your behalf to have an independent asset manager, wealth manager uh, as a partner, especially when dealing with issues or solving things or, or getting things discussed or, or, or refined out. It allows a lot of strength to be had on, on your side. Um, and then continuity. Often at banks, if you have a relationship manager or wealth management services from the bank side, uh, you're going to be one of maybe three, two, 300 clients. With us, it's going to be a much smaller uh, client load. You're going to get a lot more personalized service, and there's not as much turnover. And big banks, they're corporatized, and there's a lot of turnover. So you might like the bank, you might like your relationship manager, but he needs to go find another job. He doesn't like it for whatever reason. And in independent wealth management, there's a lot less turnover. So you like the relationship manager you have, you're going to keep him. And then it's going to, uh, you're going to be able to move banks, have multiple bank accounts with one relationship manager, as opposed to many. Uh, then you get the geographical uh, and portfolio diversification that allows you to diversify outside of the US dollar and actually physically be diversified with your holdings as well in different jurisdictions that allows just for some uh, stability and creating that nest egg outside of your own jurisdiction. Uh, enhanced privacy protection. Again, as I mentioned, Switzerland has these strict laws that uh, the data has to be safe. So that means anything being done has to be in terms of data being stored uh, information. It has to be at the highest level secure. Uh, you get the protection against the, the devaluating US dollar, which is important. And again, going back to that 10 year and overall graph, when you're invested outside of the US dollar, you get overall enhanced uh, stability, especially from the bank side when they have high capital ratios, they're not doing crazy bets in their investing departments. They're really just looking at taking care of the client. Um, so what are our investments? Our investments, how we invest at WHVP, is we're capital preservationists. We want to preserve the value of your hard-earned wealth over time while sustainably growing it. We don't invest in the US market. We don't invest in US dollar investments. So that means we're going out and finding uh, investments in stable economic environments uh, with stable currencies uh, that are stocks, bonds, precious metals, and currencies that have that position against the US dollar in the long term. How we kind of go about it is we look at the country and its currency, what's affecting it, what are they good at, what is their environment set up for, how does their central bank act in terms of decisions uh, for price stability in the currency in the long term. Uh, then once we've done that assessment, we look at, okay, what are the industries that are strong in these countries? What are the regulations set up for? How is that going to impact that industry? And then who are the great competitors in that industry? And then we really dig into those companies and the fundamentals. We do our valuations and we look for the investment opportunity from that point. So that's kind of how we do our investments. Um, the process, if you, if you say, okay, I'm very interested. How do I start this first? Or, or how does it even go? First, you schedule a 45-minute uh, consultation uh, with someone with us. It's free um, where we talk about your situation. We talk what you're worried about, what you're interested in, uh, what the value is. And, uh, and we reach a mutual decision of wanting to work together. We also, in this meeting, talk about the, the banks we work with and which we think would be a right fit, what you're interested in in a bank. Um, and once we've reached that mutual decision, um, we ask for some information to be provided so we can present you to the bank so you don't have to come to Switzerland. Uh, everything can be done uh, over correspondence. Um, that's like your, that's going to be the information that you provide initially is going to be like a passport copy, uh, your resume, a uh, source of funds, how you earn the money uh, that you want to invest, and then uh, your residential address. And with that, we can go to the bank and get the, present you as a, a client. Um, and get the account opening set, which we give to you with detailed instructions. We walk you through how to, to complete it. Once that's completed and you send it back, it gets sent to the bank's compliance department. They go through their checks. There might be some questions. Once everything's done, the account goes open. And then you can wire the funds from your U.S. bank to your new bank in Switzerland or Liechtenstein, uh, whichever bank you choose. Um, and then we have our initial investment meeting where we discuss in detail all of the investments that we are planning to place in your portfolio that we've compiled that we think fit your situation and have a good outcome for the long run. Um, and then we stay in touch. 
we, we also talk in this meeting about restrictions, things that you don't want. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that it's really personalized to your situation. Then we stay in touch by doing that through e-banking. You have your e-banking so you can see in real time what's happening if that's something you want. Uh, we have four calls a year as an option uh, where we sit down face-to-face -face, uh, uh, virtually and discuss the portfolio, uh, any questions you have. And we always tell our clients the biggest the most important thing is being able to have an open line of communication when times are good, when times are neutral, when times are difficult that we're communicating. We make sure we're trying to communicate with our client uh, enough to, the, to what you guys want. And there's an open door. We're always happy to interact with our clients to talk about questions, uh, understanding things, uh, knowing what's happening and why we made investment decisions. Um, we want that open. We also release an economic report every six weeks, and we uh, make sure that you kind of can see how we're thinking with that every six weeks. Uh, three weeks after that, at another six-week interval, we actually release a video on YouTube where we talk about some key points from that report, how things have developed, and give a little bit more explanation so you can keep up with us. We use social media to, to post things of what we're doing, how we're thinking, topics we find interesting that would bring value to you. And that's a way that you can kind of see how we think. Uh, we have countless uh, videos where you can go and watch us talk about various subjects on YouTube, uh, which you can see on the next slide. So that's kind of how we stay in contact. Um, we don't, it's not a hands-off approach from us. We really want to be interactive with our client and we don't want our clients to ever feel like they are in any way a burden uh, to us. We want to make sure that there's a trust relationship built between us. We trust you, you trust us. And then that there's communication to support that. And that's what builds trust. It's about the relationship. So with that, um, I've come to the end of my presentation. If you want to schedule that 45 free uh, or your free 45 minute consultation, Please shoot us an email at info at WHVP. Uh, you're either going to be talking to me or Jamie, who's there on my left of your screen with the uh, curly hair. Most likely might be one of our other ones. Um, this is our team at WHVP. Four of us, four of us are relationship managers, myself, uh, Jamie and Urs. They're our owners. They're, they're on the uh, right of me. Uh, if you're looking at your screen and Julia Fernandez on my left, um, those are our relationship managers. Managers all the way to your left is uh, Daniel Kohler. He's our legal and uh, compliance officer.